The building code provides a lot of fundamental information when it comes to addressing many different aspects of a home or building, providing the minimum requirements for a safe and comfortable indoor environment. But there's one aspect of the building code that seems to be relatively ambiguous, and that's condensation control and wall assemblies. Now, there are some vague references to different condensation control measures in the IBC and IRC, or International Building Code and International Residential Code, but they're all hidden and dispersed across multiple chapters. In this video, we're going to talk about condensation and wall assemblies, how and where it occurs, and the various strategies and techniques that you can use to prevent interstitial condensation so that you can have a long-lasting, dry, and durable building. Let's get into it. So first off, let's briefly talk about condensation. Condensation occurs simply when the dew point temperature is reached, in which the water vapor in the air experiences a phase change from a gas to a liquid state when it comes into contact with the thermal mass sufficient enough to sustain the phase change. This usually occurs when we have warm air coming into contact with a cold surface, as warm air has the potential to carry a lot more moisture. Think about the droplets that form on an ice-cold glass of water on a warm day. Now, the same thing happens in our buildings when there's a significant temperature differential between the outdoor environment and the interior condition space. Let's say that you live in upstate New York, where during the winter months, nighttime lows can easily be below 10 degrees Fahrenheit, and let's say that you're operating at 70 degrees Fahrenheit at 35% relative humidity, which is fairly common. What is the dew point temperature of that interior conditioned air? It's about 41 degrees, nearly 30 degrees higher than the temperature outside. Now, how are most of our walls constructed? Well, typically they're wood-framed and sheathed with plywood or OSB, at least if you're in North America, wrapped with building wrap or building paper, clad with siding, insulated cavities with bat insulation, and finished on the interior with painted gypsum board. Now, what do you think the temperature of the sheathing will be if the temperature outside is 10 degrees Fahrenheit? Pretty close to 10 degrees. So, we expect to see condensation on the back side of our sheathing in cold climates, as this is the first condensing surface. This is significantly worsened by air leakage and air pressure differentials, as this can drive a lot of concentrated moisture to the areas where holes occur, and that's where we tend to see a lot of rot damage and mold. In fact, the latest numbers came out about the significance of air leakage as a means of moisture transport through wall assemblies, and the results are astonishing and a lot worse than we had initially thought. Check out this Building Science Corporation article, which we will link in the description. So what do we have to do to control condensation? Well, we can either warm the condensing surface of the sheathing, we can slow down the movement of moisture-laden air from coming into contact with the cold surface and let it out when it gets there, or we can control interior relative humidity. The problem with controlling interior relative humidity as the only approach is that you can often be left with extremely dry air, which can be very uncomfortable to the building occupants, and can even cause things like nosebleeds and skin problems if the air is too dry. You still want to control relative humidity, but not to the point where it's unhealthy. We aim for about 35% relative humidity in the wintertime. If a higher relative humidity is desired, then we have to make modifications to the assembly to reduce the potential for condensation. What about stopping or slowing down the movement of moisture-laden air from coming into contact with the backside of the sheathing? This is actually done quite often through the use of interior air barriers and vapor retarders, usually in the form of closed cell spray foam applied continuously to the backside of the sheathing. It has to be closed cell spray foam, as open cell spray foam is too vapor permeable. It has a much lower R value per inch, and you need a thicker buildup to create an air barrier. In the building code, spray foam is more or less synonymous with the term air impermeable insulation. So how much do you need to prevent condensation? Assuming that we're operating at around 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 35% relative humidity, it depends on the climate zone, but we'll link the required R values as a percentage of the total R value of the wall assembly in this table below. Now we should mention that spray foam isn't a perfect solution by any means. Check out these videos up here if you're curious about some of the potential risks with spray foam. You could also achieve this with a taped smart vapor retarder membrane, which is sometimes referred to as a vapor variable membrane. This is applied to the warm side of the wall to prevent air leakage and slow vapor diffusion into the wall assembly, but allow for moisture to dry back to the interior if relative humidity inside the cavity begins to exceed 60%, as this is sort of considered the danger zone in terms of mold growth. This is completely different compared to the standard off-the-shelf polyethylene which traps moisture. Now we often use this strategy when we're trying to avoid spray foam and where we have no exterior rigid insulation and or where we are achieving continuous insulation requirements via a double wall assembly. 
Now, this strategy isn't perfect either, as it requires that all of the seams and joints and penetrations are taped, since air leakage is a major driver of condensation issues. Finally, we can warm the condensing surface of the sheathing with exterior rigid insulation. By insulating from the exterior, we're providing a thermal break and keeping the sheathing closer to interior conditions. In fact, if you install all of the insulation on the outside in the form of rigid insulation, this is referred to as the perfect wall by Joe Stebrick from Building Science Corporation, the guy who basically influenced all of our modern day building codes for the better. This is the safest option in terms of condensation control, and it allows for a lot more flexibility in terms of the indoor environmental conditions. How much rigid insulation do you need? Well, as it turns out, the same ratios that we use for closed cell spray foam within the cavity apply to exterior rigid insulation installed outboard of the sheathing. Now, of course, this does add some complexity and cost to the wall assembly at building transitions and penetrations like windows, but there's a lot of ways to successfully resolve these transitions, and quite frankly, the durability benefits alone are worth increasing cost. We actually have a whole video dedicated to exterior rigid insulation, which you can go and watch up here, but we'll be addressing this topic more in the future and showing details and mock-ups and on-site walkthroughs of how rigid insulation is integrated around these building transitions. We have a ton of other videos about condensation control in application and preventing air leakage for a bunch of different building conditions and environments. Make sure to go and check those out as well. If you found this video helpful, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more weekly building science videos and head over to our website at asiri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics. Links will be in the description below. Every week we get flooded with requests for consultations for projects both large and small in scale around the US and Canada, and sometimes even in Europe, and I'm pleased to announce that we're now offering general consulting services outside of our typical scope of plan and spec reviews and detail drawing development. Sometimes we're brought in just to answer questions and give guidance on how to best address certain aspects of a project, whether it's helping clients determine whether a vented or conditioned roof assembly makes sense based on their performance and durability goals, what type of insulation products to use, how to air seal very specific specific locations, how to retrofit capillary breaks and drainage, and so we're here as your resource in pre-construction to set you up for success. So how exactly does our general consulting service work and what do you get? Due to the volume of requests that we receive each week, we obviously can't work with everyone, and so we've implemented a 10 hour minimum project scope which is paid as a retainer, and that's just our minimum level of scope and engagement to make sure that we're giving your project sufficient attention throughout the entire process, and it also helps to keep things more manageable on our end. As you progress through your project, you will inevitably have some questions that will come up, and we're here to answer those questions as they come. You can schedule meetings with us, send us emails, request us to look into unique building conditions, and provide general feedback. We occasionally issue sketches and written documentation as needed to help clarify any points that we discussed, and provide additional educational resources for you and your team so that you can successfully move forward with your project with confidence. If you're looking for the additional help and need guidance on your project, but you're not quite at the point where you need detailed drawings or have architectural plans for us to review, this is the best service for you. So fill out the contact form below, give us some information about your project, and we'll be in touch soon. Cheers.